Chapter Eleven of Flash Evans, Cameron Newshawk by Frank Bell. The Slipperbox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Chapter Eleven, High Water. Bailey Brooks arose to greet the newcomer. As he turned to introduce Flash, Captain Johns forestalled him by saying, in a curt voice, "We have met before, I believe." At the Columbia Hospital, recalled Flash. The captain seated himself on the opposite side of the table, regarding the cameraman with a cold scrutiny which was not easy to interpret. Assuming that he was an intruder at a private business conference, Flash offered an apology and started to leave. No, don't go. Captain Johns waved him back into his chair. Finish your dinner. Why did you fail to keep your promise to Major Hartgrove? Flash now understood the reason behind the officer's coolness. Major Hartgrove had reported his failure to give up the requested pictures. I made no promise, he replied. It was understood that you would bring the pictures to the hospital without delay. The Major may have understood it in that way, replied Flash evenly, but I work for the Newsview Company, not the United States Army. Captain John's lips twisted in a faint suggestion of a smile yet his voice had an edge to it as he asked you still have those pictures i have what is your reason for withholding them no reason flash admitted cheerfully as a matter of fact i went back to the hospital yesterday after i had them printed the major was gone you went back after you had looked at them yourself quite right sir i wanted to see what i was giving away just protecting my paper you know yes i know responded captain johns dryly you may be interested to learn that major hartgrove has been removed to the army hospital at melveridge field doing well i hope he will be dismissed tomorrow or the day following now about those pictures where are they now in my room at the hotel may i see them i'll be glad to show them to you captain replied flash grinning but i don't think you'll find them of any aid in running down the man who struck the major let me be the judge of that now as i recall major hartgrove said you were the first person to reach him after the train wreck hardly the first sir as i approached the car i saw someone slipping away into the dark it may have been the man who robbed him you are mistaken major hartgrove was not robbed i understood otherwise an attempt was made to take major hartgrove's wallet the man did not succeed flash accepted the explanation without comment he was rather inclined to believe that the major had not been robbed however it seemed unreasonable that the army men would be making such strenuous efforts to apprehend an ordinary thief obviously major hartgrove had carried military papers or something of far greater value than money Ignoring Bailey Brooks for the moment, Captain Johns asked Flash a number of questions about his actions following the train wreck. Cleverly, but without success, he tried to make the cameraman contradict himself. At last, he seemed satisfied the young man was telling the truth, and turned his attention once more to the parachute jumper. After the meal had ended, Captain Johns volunteered to go with Flash to his room. The three walked together to the Clorinda Hotel george doyle looked up in surprise as flash pushed open the bedroom door he rose quickly to his feet you remember bailey brooks said flash and this is captain ernest johns doyle was impressed by the caller he lost his customary indifference and put himself out to be agreeable but the captain paid him scant attention i have only a few minutes he said impatiently may i see the pictures now please Flash found the envelope in his luggage. Doyle sat watching him curiously as he sorted through the prints. "'I have only one which will interest you,' he said to the captain. "'It isn't much good.' The army man examined the picture carefully and returned it to the stack. "'You are right,' he admitted regretfully. "'For our purposes it is valueless.' Methodically, he thumbed through the other prints. "'Now here is an excellent one.' a snap i took at the races too bad the wreck picture didn't come out the same way conditions were against me bailey brooks had crossed the room 
as captain johns dropped the prints carelessly on the table he picked them up and glanced through the stack the army officer turned to leave but doyle stepped forward neatly blocking his way say captain he began flash and i are with newsview you know what are the picture possibilities out at melveridge there are none mr doyle oh come now i know it's hard to get in there these days but it can be done with pole how about giving us a permit i regret i am not in a position to grant such a favor the captain returned stiffly good evening accompanied by bailey brooks he went away as soon as the footsteps receded doyle turned angrily to flash you might have said something instead of standing there like a clam here the captain is a good friend of yours he could have passed us into melveridge field the captain isn't a friend of mine then why did you bring him here you must have observed for yourself doyle to look at those pictures the technician picked up the stack and glanced through the prints what's all this about anyway he demanded why would the captain be interested flash made an evasive answer which only irritated doyle further despite the technician's displeasure he had no intention of taking him into his confidence i'm tired he said shortly let's go to bed it was dark in the hotel room when flash awakened to hear the telephone ringing struggling out of sleep he reached to roll up the window shade a few carts were creaking by on the street below the sky was barely light the telephone rang again answer it will you growled doyle all right flash took the receiver from its hook he was informed by the hotel operator that long distance was calling as he relayed the message to doyle the latter leapt from bed and seized the instrument that must be clues doyle talked for several minutes and then hung up the receiver get dressed he said curtly we are clearing out of here and we haven't much time what's up we move again clues says to let the melveridge pictures slide arrangements can't be made with the authorities a new assignment yeah not a bad one either we're to cover an international polo match at excelsior city we ought to be there not later than twelve thirty flash looked at his watch and whistled it's nearly six now excelsior city must be at least three hundred miles from here nearly three twenty it means fast stepping quickly they dressed and crammed their clothing into suitcases there was no time for breakfast a clock on the street chimed six thirty as they pulled out of the drowsing city a fog hung low over the valley before the sound truck had covered many miles a fine steady rain began to fall strangely doyle offered no complaint about either the weather or the early morning call to duty flash stole a curious glance at him the technician's face was animated and he whistled a cheerful tune this assignment seems to please you doyle it could be a lot worse what teams are playing you haven't told me anything about the setup an american team against one from india headed by raja mitra know anything about polo i've seen a few games herbert rascomb will be playing on the american team rascomb he's one of the best players in the country i never even heard of him until a few days ago rascomb doesn't like publicity he goes into a rage if his picture is taken the boys humor him and he returns the favor by showing them a good time at his lodge buys them off nothing of the sort it's only to show his appreciation we could do with a day in the north woods eh flash avoided answering the question instead he inquired why is rascomb so against publicity opposed doyle shrugged as he steered the sound truck into a filling station no he's just that way but they tell me rascomb is a fine fellow an attendant filled the gasoline tank checked the oil and replenished the water in the radiator as doyle paid him he volunteered road information aiming to take u s forty nine out of here that's right answered doyle how is the road to excelsior city the road's in good condition but if you want to be on the safe side you'd better take highway twenty three we've had some hot rains around here the coon river is over its banks 
and there's a bad bridge about six miles beyond town then the road is closed they were keeping it open an hour ago a radio report said it would be closed if the water came any higher doyle and flash studied a map highway twenty three was graveled and at least fourteen miles out of their way we'll keep on forty nine and take a chance doyle decided the decision satisfied flash for it had occurred to him that possibly they might have an opportunity to take interesting flood pictures two miles beyond the town limits they began to see evidence of high water ditches on either side of the road ran with it in several low places tiny rivers blocked their way the water was not deep and they rode through it without mishap they picked up speed on a long stretch of clear pavement ahead they could see the bridge a long wooden affair of ancient design a flimsy makeshift barrier of boards had been raised across the entrance way closed muttered doyle in disgust we'll never get to excelsior city by game time now he slammed on the brakes and brought the truck to a standstill not far from the bridge thrusting his head out the window he called to one of the guards how about letting us through we're newsreel cameramen and in a big hurry the bridge is unsafe the man answered it's apt to go out any time now flash leapt from the truck and went to look at the bridge he saw for himself that much of the underpinning had washed away the weight of an automobile even higher water would be almost certain to shift it from its position water still rising he questioned a guard coming up fast brother three inches in the last twenty minutes another half hour and this road may be completely covered flash ran back to the truck doyle had turned it around and was impatiently waiting jump in he commanded we're going to be late getting to excelsior city now that we have to backtrack listen doyle flash was excited while we're breaking our necks trying to reach there we'll be passing up better pictures what do you mean better pictures the bridge is going out any time maybe doyle retorted but we're not waiting here several hours on a slim chance like that our assignment is to shoot the polo match flash gazed steadily at the technician sorry to disagree we're staying right here say who do you think you are doyle drawled insolently i'm not taking orders from any fresh kid i've taken plenty of orders from you but not any more i'm washed up through oh so you're through eh well quit any time you like i'm not quitting flash corrected just letting you know that from now on i'm not your man friday mr clues gave me to understand i was to use my own judgment about picture values your part is to record the sound effects doyle stared at flash spots of bright color tinted his top cheeks with an effort he kept his voice under control all right evans you'll take full responsibility for this i expect to flash retorted grimly now help me get my stuff up on the roof that bridge won't last many minutes End of chapter eleven Chapter Twelve of Flash Evans, Camera News Hawk by Frank Bell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Chapter Twelve. Bridge out. Flash was prepared for a curt refusal. Surprisingly, Doyle considered a moment and then began to unload equipment. He said nothing, but his smouldering eyes made it clear he intended to make a full report to Mister Close with camera set up and focused on the bridge flash nervously waited the only thing which would justify his high-handed action would be success if the bridge failed to go out doyle would score heavily in the final reckoning the water rose higher and higher slapping against the piling with a powerful surge yet the bridge held minutes elapsed and flash became increasingly uneasy surely he thought the structure could not withstand such punishment for long doyle looked at his watch with a disgusted expression we've waited another half hour he began from far down the road came the roar of a fast-traveling automobile flash and doyle both turned to stare 
a car raced toward the bridge at seventy miles an hour it struck a dip in the road where water flowed and the tires sent up a great muddy sheet with undiminished speed the automobile sped on at the bridge guards leapt into action shouting and waving their red flags to draw attention to the barrier the driver could not fail to see that the bridge entrance was blocked still the car roared on flash suddenly comprehended the reason the man was being pursued by a state highway police car if he halted for the bridge it meant capture there's our picture doyle he shouted get ready the car struck the barrier with a resounding crash boards splintered like so much matchwood but scarcely slowed down the daring driver bridge girders rattled and planks pounded as the automobile plunged on nothing happened for a moment and then a cry of horror arose from the crowd of spectators it's going out one side of the bridge wrenched free from the piling and swung around in the swift current there it held an instant and then slowly toppled sideways into the boiling flood as the car slid with it the driver pushed open the door and leapt into the river his dark head remained above the surface for a minute then disappeared horrified at the disaster flash nevertheless pivoted his camera to photograph the entire scene the crumbling of the bridge the driver's wild leap even the arrival of the state police car which raced to the end of the road and stopped with a jolting lurch attracted by a startled outcry from the excited spectators his gaze was drawn far down river he caught a fleeting glimpse of the struggling man before the unfortunate fellow was pulled under again by the racing current the distance was too great for an effective shot but flash was not thinking of pictures leaving his camera behind he plunged into a deep ditch at the roadside wading across muddy water oozing about his armpits he ran on through a soggy field to a bend in the river once more he glimpsed the struggling man who was fighting gamely for life against overpowering odds with no thought for his own safety flash kicked off his shoes and dived into the river exerting all of his strength he fought to keep from being carried downstream he had judged the current accurately for the man was brought directly toward him reaching out he barely grasped him by the coat there was a brief struggle and they both disappeared beneath the surface after an exhausting effort they regained the surface and drifted with the current using what strength remained to keep their heads above water even with lungs bursting flash managed to hold tightly to the man whenever he could he gulped in air but breath and strength were ebbing suddenly he felt himself dashed against a solid object the current had brought a long heavy plank downstream he pulled himself and his companion on to it and they clung with head and shoulders well above water for a minute the river carried them swiftly then their ride ended abruptly as the plank caught against a half-submerged fallen tree which was festooned with a motley collection of debris and foam there the plank lodged fast they were able to secure fairly firm holds on the projecting arms of the tree but the current whipped their legs beneath them and threatened to sweep them on grimly they clung to their precarious refuge the man flash had aided aroused himself after a dazed moment and looked about in panic easy now warned flash instead of thanking the cameraman for saving his life he began to revile him if you had kept out of this i would have made a clean getaway now the dicks probably are on my tail the man's words proved prophetic for the state police had followed down the river and were at a point opposite where the pair clung a rope sailed accurately through the air settling across the tree reaching to his full length flash was able to grasp it as he started to knot it about his companion's body the man struck wildly at him they won't get me he shouted hoarsely i'll drown first his hold loosened but flash acted quickly he seized the man's coat collar with his left hand maintaining his own grasp on the tree limb the swift current whipped his legs from beneath him but help was at hand a state patrolman who was a strong swimmer reached the sunken tree he tied the rope about the struggling man and signaled for a fast haul in to shore flash followed with the officer 
good work a trooper praised him you took a big chance young man both with the river and your pal here know who he is flash shook his head he was searching for his discarded shoes andy clevenger not the bank robber the same he was recognized at a quarantine stop but got away we've chased him twenty miles flash began wringing water from his ruined suit he was plastered with mud from head to foot there's a reward out for clevenger's capture the state policeman went on you may get some of the money give me your name and address i think i can guarantee you a new suit at least i can use it and i'd like permission to take some pictures before you pack this fellow off to jail go right ahead handcuffed the prisoner was led back to the patrol car where flash shot close-ups and obtained complete information about his past record doyle somewhat stunned by the events which had transpired had little to say are you sorry we waited flash asked him these pictures should stack up any day with a polo match you're a fool for luck just as joe said doyle muttered i suppose you knew just what would happen i only hoped for a good bridge picture but when lady luck showers down i believe in spreading a wide net flash was shivering from cold wrapping himself in his overcoat he allowed doyle to do most of the loading work back in town once more he sought a clothing store and quickly purchased a new suit while it was cheaply tailored he thought it would serve until he reached excelsior city you look like a country rube in that outfit doyle jeered as his companion climbed back into the sound truck can't help it flash replied undisturbed it's warm and clean at least the cameraman followed highway twenty three avoiding the river at the first city of any size which boasted an airport they paused long enough to ship their cans of film to the home office then they drove on at breakneck speed for excelsior city doyle squinted at a clock in a store window as they went through a town by skipping lunch we still might get there in time for the last chucker of the game he announced it won't do any harm to try flash agreed but after the pictures we just took polo will seem pretty tame it's our assignment doyle said sharply don't forget that i've not forgotten flash glanced sideways at his companion he could not believe that doyle honestly thought they had made a mistake in passing up a polo game for the flood pictures obviously the technician had a special reason for wishing to reach excelsior city and that reason he reflected has nothing to do with our work if i'm any good at guessing he's bent on wangling an invitation to rascomb's lodge End of chapter twelve chapter thirteen of flash evans cameron newshawk by frank bell this liverbox recording is in the public domain reading by matt perard chapter thirteen a polo game the newsview soundtrack pulled into the private grounds of the excelsior polo club at exactly ten minutes to three through the elm trees george doyle caught sight of the field and gave a chuckle of pleasure the match is still on the seventh chucker was under way as the truck drew up at the sidelines flash and doyle worked swiftly knowing they had little time how's the score the technician demanded of a spectator six to four in favor of the internationals flash carefully looked over the field as he focused his camera two riders were outstanding raja mitra for the internationals and herbert rascomb on the american team mitra a handsome dark man of thirty handled his mount expertly his clashes with rascomb were frequent deliberately flash trained the camera lens upon them doyle's protest was immediate and explosive say what's the idea do you want to make rascomb store since when are we working for him flash countered we're here to get good pictures he happens to be one of the best players on the field the argument might have waxed warmer but just then the tucker ended with a spectacular goal made by rascomb he wheeled his horse a beautiful black mare and rode over to the sound wagon 
good afternoon boys he said heartily taking a few pictures news view doyle replied that last shot of yours was pretty mr rascomb thank you thank you the sportsman doffed his cork helmet mockingly and his lips parted in a smile the fact is rajah mitra is too fast for me today a marvelous player that man there was an expansive friendly quality to rascomb which attracted flash despite himself for some reason he had felt distrustful of the man now that he had heard him speak the feeling was slipping away a little request boys the sportsman said casually no close-ups of me please you don't like to be photographed flash inquired watching the man curiously rascomb's dark eyes appraised the cameraman his glance took in the cheap suit the muddy shoes wrinkled tie you'll have to excuse evans appearance doyle spoke apologetically he fell into a river this morning a river rascomb asked in amusement flash did not bother to explain or correct doyle's misstatement after a lengthy pause the polo player inquired thoughtfully haven't i seen you somewhere before your face seems familiar funny i was thinking the same thing when i first saw you that was at the indianapolis auto races oh so you saw me there yes i have a picture as a souvenir snapped it while you were talking with one of the drivers in the pit the pleasant smile receded from rascomb's face the corners of his lips twitched i dislike being photographed he said i dislike it intensely it makes me especially nervous to know that a camera is focused upon me during a polo match i trust you'll oblige me by not taking any pictures except from across the field oh sure doyle said instantly before flash could answer we'll be glad to do you that little favor you'll not lose by it rascomb wheeled his horse as if to ride away plainly he was irritated flash decided to court further displeasure i'd like to ask a personal question if you don't mind mr rascomb he remarked are you related to a man named povey povey the sportsman demanded sharply albert povey he was listed as killed in the recent train wreck whatever gave you the idea i knew him i was told that you had claimed the body rascomb's expression became inscrutable his dark eyes bored into flash as if probing for what lay behind the question he moistened his lips to speak at that instant a player motioned to him from across the field rascomb's relief was obvious excuse me he said i'll talk with you later jerking his mount's head he rode to his post the game was resumed what was the idea of deliberately trying to antagonize rascomb doyle accused such tactics won't get you anywhere maybe not a trip to the hunting lodge flash cheerfully admitted he had no intention of allowing rascomb to dictate what pictures he could or could not take oddly as the game continued no occasion arose to photograph the sportsman at close range rascomb played erratically his mallet slashed wickedly but many of his shots were badly placed losing his temper he began jerking his horse about and calling it an evil brute the internationals led by the rajah piled up two goals in rapid succession and won by a wide margin secretly flash wondered if rascomb had been upset by the question about albert povey the game over doyle seemed in no haste to leave the club grounds i'll be back in a little while he said vaguely and wandered down to the stables where rascomb last had been seen take your time presently flash saw the pair disappear into the clubhouse together he settled himself in the truck for a long way doyle is breaking his neck to make a good impression on that fellow he thought oh well it's none of my affair he was half tempted to follow doyle into the clubhouse while he had no desire to seek rascomb's favor he would enjoy driving the sportsman into a corner with another question about albert povey a half hour elapsed before doyle returned to the truck he was in high spirits rascomb and i had a long talk together he declared enthusiastically i think i've swung it an invitation to rascomb's lodge 
doyle nodded as he guided the sound truck down the winding road to the main highway he's been thinking of getting up a weekend party out at his place if he does he'll telephone us tonight at the parker hotel us rascomb isn't a fellow to hold a grudge you were short with him but he's overlooking it nice of him flash said dryly he was interested in you doyle admitted asked a lot of questions did he what sort of questions oh nothing out of the way just who you were where you came from and what sort of fellow you were if the invitation comes through we'll both be included it was decent of you to put in a good word for me flash said nevertheless i don't think i'll be interested then you're a sap rascom would show us a wonderful time and it wouldn't cost us a penny i'm not so sure i figure there's a string attached somewhere a string what do you mean i don't know myself flash admitted i'll be frank and say rascom has me puzzled driving back to excelsior city the newsreel men located themselves at the parker hotel not wishing to be far from a telephone doyle insisted upon dining in the building later he returned to his room flash remained in the lobby reading a newspaper until after nine o'clock entering the bedroom he found doyle gloomily playing a game of solitaire your telephone call didn't come through flash asked no rascom must have been handing me a line it's enough to make a fellow sick i'm sorry you didn't get the invitation george flash said sincerely still i don't see how you could have made the trip we're supposed to be working for newsview no new assignment has come through they expect to give us a day off now and then flash began to check through his suitcase to see what clothes he would need to buy he had written his mother for additional shirts and underwear but it would take days for a package to overtake him the suit he had worn in his river plunge must be sent to the cleaners whether or not it ever could be worn again was problematical as he sorted garments flash came upon the envelope which contained photographic prints he poured them out on the table examining them one by one reaching the last print a peculiar expression crossed his face that's queer he muttered he went through the stack a second time taking care that two did not stick together the picture he sought was not there his chair made a grating sound on the bare floor as he turned to face his roommate doyle he said quietly tell me the straight truth did you remove a picture of herbert rascomb from this envelope End of chapter thirteen chapter fourteen of flash evans camera news hawk this LibriVox recording is in the public domain reading by matt berard chapter fourteen rascomb's invitation george doyle slammed the deck of cards together tossing the box into a suitcase which lay open on the floor he regarded flash with an insolent offended gaze now what would i want with any of your pictures i thought you might have looked at them while i was downstairs you thought doyle mocked why don't you come right out and accuse me of being a sneak thief your personal effects are of no interest to me little man not the slightest i'm not accusing you flash replied quietly i was merely asking i don't like your tone i didn't mean to imply anything but it still seems queer that the picture isn't here doyle lighted a cigarette in his most deliberate manner and then asked which one is missing a snap i took of rascom at the races the only good picture in the lot you probably lost it yourself it was in the envelope yesterday when i showed the pictures to captain johns and bailey brooks then maybe they took it doyle suggested sarcastically why don't you get up search warrants flash allowed the matter to rest yet he was not altogether convinced that his roommate knew nothing about the missing picture herb rascomb may have asked him to get it from me he thought i made a mistake in talking too much today 
at the polo match the telephone rang doyle leapt to his feet that must be rusting now he exclaimed we may get our trip yet count me out flash murmured but the technician did not hear doyle talked for several minutes on the telephone and his eager responses made it evident he was speaking with rascomb presently he placed his hand over the mouthpiece turning toward flash rascomb wants us to come out to his place for the weekend well your fish is playing with the bait better play him right so he doesn't get away rascomb says to bring you along thanks i'm not interested i'll stay here at the hotel doyle frowned for some reason rascomb especially wants you and it will be a wonderful opportunity for us to get some unusual newsreel shots of what flash asked showing faint interest rascomb has invited raja mitra as one of his guests if we can get him togged up in full dress regalia he ought to be worth fifty feet at least maybe flash conceded we might get some good nature pics while we're there doyle went on eagerly it's wild around clear lake how about it flash had no time to consider while he was reluctant to accept rascomb's hospitality he did have a curiosity to see him again if only to ask about albert povey all right i'll go he decided doyle relayed the message to rascomb and hung up the receiver rascomb and his guests are motoring out to the lodge tonight he explained we leave in the morning rascomb says it will be a slow trip over dirt roads so we ought to get a fairly early start flash nodded and began to prepare for bed long after doyle had gone to sleep he lay in the darkened room staring at a patch of electric light which shone through the window there were a number of things which puzzled him why had rascomb insisted upon including him in the invitation he felt satisfied the sportsman had not liked him particularly unable to solve the puzzle flash finally dropped off to sleep he awoke to find doyle shaking him roll out seven o'clock as flash dressed doyle made slighting remarks about his appearance suggesting that it might be well to buy a new suit of clothes before they started for the lodge sorry but i can't buy a new suit before i get home flash replied unmoved this one will have to do they breakfasted at a cafe across from the hotel and by eight o'clock were ready to start for clear lake twenty miles away as the sound truck rolled out of the city flash remarked you sent clues a wire didn't you telling him we were after special pictures well no i didn't doyle answered carelessly this is friday he won't be around the office until monday anyway do you think we should pull out without leaving word sure after those blood picks we've turned in clues will expect to give us a few days off it's customary while the arrangement was not pleasing to flash he could do nothing about it and so settled himself for an uncomfortable ride they followed the pavement for a distance of four miles and then turned down a narrow rutty road the truck jounced and bumped shaking the loose equipment around there was almost no traffic but whenever they did pass an automobile a great cloud of suffocating dust rolled into their faces this section must have missed the rains flash remarked even the trees looked dry the car rattled on making poor time doyle fumed at the delay and kept glancing at his watch flash was in no hurry for the trip to end while the ride might be uncomfortable the scenery was interesting hillocks were studded with huge boulders and the twisting roadway was hemmed in with pine trees now and then they glimpsed a patch of blue lake tucked behind the screen of evergreens a half hour's drive brought them to the railroad town of clear lake which consisted of little more than a post office and a few houses at the edge of the village stood a ranger station a man in uniform held up his hand for the truck to stop your newsreel man i see the ranger observed pleasantly going in to take pictures of the fire what fire doyle asked in astonishment a small one has been reported over near craig point the wind is blowing it this way thought i'd give you a word of warning we didn't know anything about it doyle replied 
we're on our way to herbert rascomb's lodge you'll be in no danger there at least not unless the wind should shift again i wonder if we couldn't get some fire pictures for a news view flash began speculatively how far is craig point from rascomb's place before the ranger could answer doyle broke in impatiently listen we're not doing any fire pictures this trip mugging the rajah will be the extent of our labors now that it had been called to their attention flash and doyle both imagined they could smell smoke in the air they could not see it nor were they able to detect any actual signs of fire it seems to me we're passing up an unusual opportunity flash remarked as they rode on you're new at this business doyle replied discouragingly when you first start in everything looks like a wonderful idea i helped cover a forest fire in minnesota two years ago it was no fun i'm telling you i shouldn't think it would be you burn yourself to a crisp and ruin your clothes then more than likely your shots are no good or the editor cuts them out in favor of a bathing beauty parade at atlantic city not for me a short distance beyond the town flash called doyle's attention to a cleared field in its center stood a lone hangar through the windows they were able to see a red and black painted airplane this must be rascomb's private landing field flash remarked probably doyle agreed we're close to his place now a half mile farther on the sound truck reached the road which branched off to the left entrance was blocked by a wooden gate which bore a carved sign plainly marked rascomb lodge no admittance flash unfastened the barrier and doyle drove through the road led them deeper into the forest and presently emerged in a cleared area to their right lay a crescent-shaped lake with motor and rowboats tied up at the dock some distance back stood a sprawling structure made of logs with a great cobblestone chimney there were no automobiles parked in the yard the boats tugging gently at their moorings provided the only sign of occupation this place looks deserted observed flash rascomb will be here but you said he had invited other guests raja mitra they may not have arrived yet leaving the sound truck at the end of the road flash and doyle walked to the side door of the lodge their approach had been observed before they could knock the door opened herbert rascomb dressed in dark shirt and slacks a pipe thrust in the corner of his mouth greeted them heartily good morning boys glad you were able to come how do you like our roads out this way rascomb stepped aside for them to pass before him into the living room a fire blazed on the hearth it was an inviting scene and their host had a comfortable way of making them feel welcome yet the absence of guests puzzled flash raja mitra isn't here yet he inquired rascomb hesitated and then said i deeply regret that the rajah was compelled to change his plans he isn't coming unfortunately no the rajah expected to be my guest but he was called to new york this morning i should have telephoned you we have no telephone here at the lodge it would have meant an early trip to the ranger station then if there are to be no pictures we may as well start back to town flash remarked glancing at doyle i couldn't think of allowing you to hasten away rascomb interposed smoothly you must have luncheon and remain for the night i can put you up quite comfortably my cook is excellent that's mighty nice of you doyle said giving flash a hard look we'll be glad to stay you sure have a nice place here merely comfortable not pretentious rascomb smiled now make yourselves at home if you care to fish my man fleur will be glad to take you out on the lake rascomb's manner was perfect he chatted with flash and doyle about their work and after they had removed the dust of their trip left them to entertain themselves the cameraman wandered alone down to the lake a breeze ruffled the blue water slapping waves against the boats tied up at the dock it whistled softly in the pine trees rubbing the boughs gently together about the place there was an atmosphere of quiet and peace yet flash felt uneasy turning his head he glanced back toward the lodge rascomb stood in the doorway the man was watching them and smiling a cold 
triumphant smile doyle flash said in a low tone yes what's on your mind now this rajah business is a phony rascomb never did invite him to the lodge do me a favor and let's get away from here End of chapter 14chapter fifteen of flash ovens camera newshawk by frank bell this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by Matt perard chapter fifteen through the pass george doyle sat down on the edge of the dock leaning his back against a post you bore me with these schoolboy ideas of yours flash he yawned who cares about rajah mitra we're here and we can have a good time if you'll act fairly appreciative instead of being so blame suspicious there's something about our friend rascomb i don't like oh you make me tired doyle said in exasperation go soak your head in the lake flash turned angrily and walked down a cindered path which led into the woods it was useless to argue with doyle he had been unwise even to mention his thoughts yet it was possible that his misgivings were without foundation gravel crunched behind him whirling around he faced herbert rascomb hope i didn't startle you his host said pleasantly they fell into step feeling certain that the man had joined him for a purpose flash waited for rascomb to introduce the topic of conversation for a time his host talked casually of work he was having done on his place he pointed out various kinds of trees displaying a genuine knowledge and interest in nature finally he remarked yesterday at the polo game you spoke of an acquaintance of mine the late albert povey you knew the man only by reputation i have been told he was a spy who plotted against our government a spy rascomb smiled broadly well possibly but i doubt it i'll admit his life had mysterious aspects yet he was an interesting man most interesting in some ways you remind me of him flash said boldly you have the same dark eyes and facial contours when first i saw you it struck me you might be related indeed povey had no relatives in this country that was why i claimed his body from a feeling of charity so you think i resemble him eh he was only a first impression povey's face had an ugly scar your voice and manner are entirely different from his then you are satisfied i have not adopted a disguise rascomb asked lightly quite satisfied no doubt it may strike you as strange that i should befriend a man of povey's type rascomb went on after a moment i never did believe all the stories about him and as i say he was an interesting fellow and very entertaining where was povey buried mr rascomb in the churchyard at clear lake the grave has no marker as yet i expect to arrange for one soon perhaps you would like to visit the cemetery no i believe not flash declined povey meant nothing to me yet i must say you seem deeply interested in him merely curiosity to be frank mr rascomb i wondered about your connection with the man it seemed odd i'm not surprised at that i met povey a year ago at one of my clubs then a few days ago i read about his death in the newspapers learning there was no one to take charge of the funeral i assumed the responsibility it was a fine thing to do it seemed to flash that rascomb was trying a little too hard to impress him however the man's explanation was logical he had no reason to doubt it strange you thought i resembled povey rascomb chuckled not very flattering i fear i meant no offence apologized flash the resemblance if any is slight and i have no scar rascomb laughed good-naturedly that should place me above suspicion they talked of other subjects presently the ringing of a bell summoned them to luncheon throughout the meal rascomb took special pains to, to be agreeable to his two guests once he rose to close a window apologizing for smoke which filtered into the dining-room 
the fire is moving in fast doyle remarked uneasily any danger of being caught here with our sound truck none whatsoever rascomb replied undisturbed if there is the slightest danger the rangers will warn us in ample time while we're here i wish we could get some pictures said flash you don't want to try it george well we could i suppose he returned reluctantly mr rascomb obligingly drew a rough map showing the location of the fire in relation to the lodge there are no roads which would take you near enough he said now you could go by boat across elbow lake if the fire reaches the beaver dam and gershom's pass you should get interesting pictures how soon can we start flash asked eagerly any time but i suggest waiting at least an hour it will save us a long tedious trip your best chance for pictures is at gershom's pass flash and doyle went at once to the truck to select the camera and equipment they would take with them the technician's interest in the adventure had been greatly stimulated by their host's enthusiasm rascomb is a real fellow he declared i guess i was wrong about him flash acknowledged he's obliging enough while doyle returned to the house to talk with rascomb he wandered down to the water's edge a loud clattering sound not unlike a battery of machine guns all firing at once caused him to turn his head a gray-haired old man in a checkered black-and-white shirt was testing an outboard motor which had been mounted on a barrel he shut it off as flash walked over to him good afternoon the old fellow said pleasantly been putting this consign put putter through its paces she runs pretty good when you get her going but she's down backwards about studding guess it's the ignition you're mr Fleur, aren't you that's me you seem to be able to turn your hand to almost anything got to around this place Fleur said gruffly i look after it for mr rascomb all year round that means being a cook a mechanic a guide a fisherman and general handyman don't you get lonesome i used to yes sir that was when mr rascomb first bought this place for the last year he spent more time here so it hasn't been so bad i'm not kicking mr rascomb is as fine a boss as i ever had Floor paused and looked intently out across the lake the pupils of his still gray eyes contracting in the bright sunlight see that dead swimming in the water first time i've ever known em to come near the lodge they're being driven by the fire flash made out a dark form in the water but soon lost it is the fire coming this way he asked looks like it to me flora answered ruskin says you're aiming to take some pictures of a gushing pass way better watch yourself that's my advice doyle and rascomb came briskly down the path to the dock are you ready asked flash mr rascomb is going along with us the technician said he thinks we need a guide we don't like to put you to so much trouble flash responded you never could find the pass without someone to show you the way rascomb replied i'll enjoy the trip anything with an element of danger always interests me selecting a boat he attached the outboard motor which fleur had been testing she ain't actin none too well mr rascomb the caretaker warned as he watched the three leave the dock at a steady but slow pace the boat plied its course across the lake and then along the shore for three miles the air was filled with smoke and fine cinders drifted down in the treetops myriads of birds made an excited racket as they fled the marching flames coming to the mouth of a small river which emptied into the lake rascomb switched off the motor this will be the best way to go he said indicating the stream it will take us beyond the beaver dam and the pass when rascomb switched on the motor again it would not start in turn flash and doyle tinkered with it the trouble as Flora suggested was in the ignition but they could not locate it we're wasting time rascomb said getting out the oars if we want to get there we'll have to row flash rather admired the manner in which his 
host accepted a difficult situation clearly rascomb was not one to turn back when confronted with trouble he was an out-of-doors man a person who used his wits and adapted himself to whatever came as the boat made slow progress upstream rascomb seemed to be the only member of the party who enjoyed the adventure his eyes flashed and he kept up a steady stream of animated conversation at length he steered the boat to shore explaining that it was necessary to portage around a beaver dam which blocked the river while doyle and rascomb moved the craft flash took pictures rejoining his companions they rode on through a narrow pass lined to the water's edge with dry brush and scrub trees by this time the low rumble of the fire plainly was audible flaming brands carried on the high wind dropped with a hissing sound about the boat rascomb indicated a cliff to the right a quarter of a mile beyond the pass you might get a fairly good view of the fire from that high point after a hard climb the three at last reached the summit gazing to the eastward they saw a great wall of flame and smoke a wave of heat rose from the valley smashing at their faces setting up his camera flash ran through fifty feet of film and reloaded so engrossed did he become in his task that he lost all count of time rascomb touched his arm we should be starting back he said the wind is bringing the fire this way if the brush should catch behind us from a flying brand we might easily be trapped flash shouldered his camera at a fast pace they started down the hillside reaching the boat rascomb tried once more to start the motor and failed for the first time he displayed anxiety i'll feel safer when we are beyond the pass he said seizing the oars but the current should take us down fairly fast rascomb rowed tirelessly refusing to allow flash or doyle to relieve him he sent the boat forward in powerful spurts they swept around a curve of the river a gasp of horror escaped from doyle who sat in the bow rascomb stopped rowing directly ahead lay gershom's pass and on either shore lining the narrow space rose walls of flame there was a moment of stunned silence then rascomb spoke well boys we're trapped if we stay here only one thing to do we must wet our clothing and try to run through it End of chapter 15chapter sixteen of flash evans cameron newshawk by frank bell this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by matt perard chapter sixteen doyle's treachery flash and doyle stared in sheer fascination at the sight before their eyes even as they recognized the danger their pulses quickened at the possibility of a spectacular picture of the flaming pass what a shot that will make gasped doyle give me the camera flash rascomb had no interest in pictures at such a moment steering the boat to shallow water he sprang out ordering tersely wet your clothing and be quick about it the newsreel men both obeyed but doyle dragged the camera after him moving up shore a few yards he focused it upon gershom pass come back here don't be a fool rascomb shouted harshly we've no time for pictures now dousing his entire body in the river he motioned for flash to do likewise now into the boat he commanded if doyle wants to stay here that's his funeral not ours flash hesitated he had no intention of leaving doyle behind but unquestionably it was no time for picture-taking get in i say rascomb's hard tone brought flash up sharply in this moment of stress the man's voice had changed completely gone was every trace of the cultivated drawl which had made his speech distinctive flash stared at roscombe with wet clothing clinging to his body hair plastered against his forehead the man looked much thinner even more startlingly a tiny pink smear was visible on his left cheek the edges of a jagged scar were faintly perceptible flash saw the disfiguring mark and suddenly understood taken completely by surprise he could not hide an expression of horrified amazement nor was he able to choke off a low cry pulvy 
rascomb's face became contorted with rage seizing an oar he swung it with deadly aim flash ducked and jerked up a hand to ward off the blow swiftly as he acted he was not quick enough to entirely deflect it the oar struck him glancingly on the head momentarily stunned he staggered sideways clutching at the boat for support his weight pulled it over throwing rascomb into the water before flash could struggle to his feet brutal hands were at his throat he fought weakly to free himself then he was given a powerful shove out into deep water the current caught him pulling him downstream dazed flash could not battle against it he rolled over on his back doyle he tried to shout his words came only as a choked gurgle he slipped beneath the surface fought up again and losing interest in the struggle knew no more flash recovered consciousness to find himself lying on his side in the soft mud his feet trailed in the water whether or not he had reached shore by his own efforts or the current had brought him there he did not know pulling himself to his knees he gazed about downstream the wall of fire had risen to proper height burning brands dropped like snowflakes making a hissing sound as they were extinguished by the water there was no sign of rascomb doyle or the boat bitter thoughts surged over flash so he had been deserted and left to die he might expect such treatment from albert povey who had masqueraded as rascomb but doyle's actions were unexplainable struggling to his feet he gazed hopelessly upstream fires were starting everywhere and slowly spreading together rascomb had said the only way out was through gersham pass should he attempt to reach the lodge by the woods route he was almost certain to find himself soon hemmed in by flames either he must attempt the pass or remain submerged in water until the fire had burned itself out flash was in no mood to wait a frenzy possessed him to get back to the lodge and confront both rascomb and doyle as yet the full meaning of his important discovery was not entirely clear but about one point he was certain albert povey never had lost his life in the wreck of the streamliner instead the man merely had found it expedient to disappear rascomb actually was povey yet it seemed fantastic had the man lived a dual life for years planning toward the day when he might wish to blot out one personality and assume another povey must be wanted by officials for questioning as a spy flash reasoned probably that was why he decided to disappear i must get back to town and let the authorities know raising a hand to his throbbing head he forced himself to think only of the problem immediately confronting him unless he acted quickly he might never escape to tell his story determining to attempt the pass flash waded out into midstream allowing the swift current to carry him off his feet he floated with it stroking only enough to keep from being swung toward shore again the suffocating cinder-filled air was a little easier to breathe close above the water but the terrific heat became almost unbearable as the shores of the river narrowed he took a deep breath and swam below the surface after a few moments he was forced to emerge again flames seemed to be everywhere about him gulping in air flash dived again this time he kept under until his lungs ached when he came up the worst lay behind him aided by the current he alternately swam and floated until he reached the river's outlet staggering from the water he leaned against a tree and gazed across the lake he knew where the lodge should be but he could not see it because of the smoke the sun had been entirely blotted out following the shore line flash walked as rapidly as he could his wet clothing impeded him and chills began to rack his body several times he slipped into bog up to his knees the day seemed to grow steadily darker with a sense of shock flash realized that night actually was coming on he tried to walk faster but could not each step had become a torment for he had discarded his shoes while swimming in the river with darkness closing in swiftly flash lost all sense of bearing and clung doggedly to the shore to the rear the sky was red with leaping flames ahead there was nothing to guide him 
blindly he staggered on and then through the trees he caught the gleam of a light shining from a cabin window he had reached the lodge the clearing opened up ahead of him finding himself on rascomb's property flash tempered his approach with caution save for the light there was no sign of anyone about the place reaching the dock he counted the boats and bent to examine them the one which doyle and rascomb had used was tied to a post with a charred rope they returned safely all right he muttered and they're figuring they're well rid of me flash had taken no time to consider his next move but sober reflection now convinced him it would be folly to confront doyle and rascomb in his present weakened condition at best it would be two against one his wisest course was to go into town and tell his story to the authorities walking unsteadily he made his way to the road where the newsview truck had been parked hours before it was gone as flash stood leaning against a tree debating the door of the lodge slammed shut a dark figure moved down the gravel path toward him that may be rascomb coming now he thought quickly he stepped behind the protecting trunk of the giant birch and waited End of chapter 16chapter seventeen of flash evans camera news hawk by frank bell this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by matt Perard. chapter seventeen a key to a mystery halfway down the path the man paused and lighted a gasoline lantern in the bright glow flash distinguished the caretaker fleur anyone here the old man called he turned his lantern at different angles throwing the beam over the ground flash stepped from behind the tree good evening fleur the caretaker gave a gasp of surprise and nearly dropped the lantern well if it ain't the young fella he exclaimed and us giving you up for dead i'm mighty glad to see you back safe and sound i sure am where is rascomb flash demanded curtly and my very good friend doyle they both came back together hours ago mr doyle and mr rascomb was bad upset over the accident accident you've fallen out of the boat the way you did and upsetting it oh so i upset the boat don't you remember nothing about it flora asked raising the lantern so he could see flash to better advantage i don't remember it that way you're sure a sight flora said quickly must have had a bad time of it how did you get out alive swam through gershon pass and walked around the lake and all the time mr rascomb and mr doyle was worried sick thinking you was drowned mr rascomb said you went down just like a rock and never came to the top even they kept dragging long as they dast then they gave you up and made a dash through the gap barely made it by the skin of the teeth where is rascomb now him and your friend started for town about an hour ago to notify the coroner they'll be happy to see you back safe and sound surprised is the right word you will have your little joke chuckled the old man i'm telling you it wasn't no joking matter with them they both was bad hit mr rascomb spoke out sharp to me for the first time since i come to work for him flash scarcely listened i must get to excelsior city at once he said abruptly cutting flora short is there a car here mr rascomb said Anne, i'll fetch it from the garage while you wash up want me to lay out some clean clothes and a pair of shoes for you never mind i'll help myself to what i need you bring the car i'm in a big hurry carrying the lantern with him flor disappeared in the direction of the garage the door of the lodge had been left half open flash limped to it but at the threshold he hesitated he seemed to his sense of presence sinister and very close at hand yet he heard nothing shaking off the uncomfortable sensation he entered the lodge a light burned in the living room but the other rooms and the entrance hall were dark flash crossed to the bathroom where he switched on a light and washed what grime he could from his hands and face his hair and eyebrows were singed a large knob had appeared on his head he had changed his clothes when he heard a slight sound in an adjoining room that's you flora he called no one answered 
turning off the light flash stepped outside a board creaked he whirled swiftly before he could defend himself he was struck directly behind the knees thrown off balance he crumpled and fell to the floor a flashlight beam played upon his face blinding him the muzzle of a revolver pressed into his ribs stay where you are the voice low-spoken and cool belonged to herbert rascomb so it's you povey there is no such person as albert povey flash's captor corrected it will pay you dividends to keep that fact in mind no don't move i really shouldn't enjoy pumping you full of lead you prefer to assault your victims with oars rascomb laughed as he snapped on a lamp above the desk keeping flash covered he motioned for him to rise and sit on a straight-backed chair against the wall you forced my hand this afternoon he said i acted without due thought or i should have handled the situation differently you mean you would have cracked me harder flash retorted your unexpected return has inconvenienced me rascomb admitted pleasantly yet i hope you believe that i did not desire your death you are a fellow with nerve i admire courage unfortunately your curiosity in a matter which never need have concerned you jeopardizes my interests so you have decided to blot me out nothing that drastic providing you decide to forget a few of your remarkable observations meaning i am never to reveal that you are povey we understand each other evans now i had planned to retire to a quiet life here at my lodge but you have made that impossible i shall attend to a few necessary tasks one deal in particular and then disappear my only demand from you is that you forget you ever knew either rascom or povey and if i refuse i shall find an effective means of dealing with you if you become annoying however your wagging tongue can do me very little harm by the time you are free i shall be a long distance from excelsior city still keeping his revolver trained on flash rascomb picked up an overcoat and hat from the table he had changed into a well-tailored business suit and had retouched the tell-tale scar so that it no longer was visible you will be quite safe and comfortable here he said backing toward the door the fire will miss the lodge by many miles as soon as i am well away i will mail the key to one of the rangers good evening he slipped swiftly out the door a key turned in the lock making a quick appraisal of his prison flash saw that it was one of the few inside rooms of the lodge a small den with no windows the only exit was through the door its panels were heavy oak and could not be rammed even with a piece of furniture quiet settled over the lodge after a short time flash heard a car drive out of the yard there was a shuffling of shoes through the gravel then a heavy step outside the door floor he shouted pounding on the panel take it easy young fella take it easy the caretaker called soothingly it won't do you no good to try to pound your way out of that mr rascomb's gone for the doctor let me out of here fleur flash pleaded rascomb will get away you don't know who he is he's albert povey a spy you plumb out of your head just as mr rascomb said fleur returned sadly it must have come from what you went through during the fire just take it easy listen fleur i'll pay you well to let me out of here mr rascomb's orders are to keep you in there until he gets back with the doctor i wouldn't das do different even if i was a mind to flash argued until he realized he was talking for his own benefit fleur had gone despondently he sank down into a chair never had he been more discouraged the key to a mystery in his hand and he was powerless to use it unless he escaped quickly rascomb would vanish and leave no trace flash sat staring at the oaken panel suddenly he made a significant observation the door swung on large ornamental brass hinges which had been fastened on the inside with tiny screws he sprang to his feet maybe i'll get out of here yet he thought exultantly maybe i will End of chapter seventeen
Chapter 18 of Flash Evans, Camera Newshawk by Frank Bell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Ferrari. Chapter 18 Escape. Flash searched his pockets for a knife he usually carried. It was missing, as were many other articles which had been lost in his flight from the forest fire. A desk occupied one corner of the room. Crossing to it, he began searching for an object which might be used to pry off the hinges of the outside door. Save for a few scattered pens, blank paper, and metal clips, the drawers were empty. They all gave evidence of having been hastily cleaned out. Just my luck, grumbled Flash. In disgust, Flash slammed one of the drawers shut. It jammed and did not entirely close. For a moment, he thought the wood was warped. Then he saw that a piece of cardboard prevented it from returning to its normal position. Jerking out the drawer completely, he ran his hand into the opening and brought to light an old faded photograph. One glance assured him that it was a picture of Albert Povey in his younger years. The man wore the military uniform of a foreign country, which Flash did not recognize. Across the bottom of the picture had been scrawled a name and date. Albert Povey december twenty second nineteen seventeen flash studied the photograph with deep interest povey's face was marked with the same jagged scar which had identified him in later years deciding to keep the picture as evidence he carefully folded it and placed it in an inside coat pocket this may prove useful he murmured to make certain no other article had dropped behind the drawer he again ran his hand into the opening his fingers encountered a paper booklet of smooth finish. Pulling it out, he saw that it was a railroad timetable. Flash would have tossed it aside had not a penciled circle drawn his attention to the second page. A train number had been marked, and it was the same streamliner which Povey had taken from Brandale. He stuffed the timetable into his pocket along with the photograph. The two discoveries added nothing to his general knowledge, but if ever he should meet Rascomb again, the evidence might be of use. Next, his search took him to the bathroom, which connected with the den, and which also lacked windows. Almost at once he was rewarded. In the medicine cabinet he found two tools, a nail file, and a rusty razor blade. Diligently, Flash set to work, trying to remove the screws which held the ornamental door hinges. The task was a tedious one. Twice he was compelled to wait as he heard Flora's step in a nearby hall. Success crowned his efforts at last. With the hinges off, he swung back the door and stepped from his prison. Flash stood for a moment, listening. The only sound came from a dripping faucet in the kitchen. He moved stealthily to the door. It had been locked from the outside. The door opening from the dining room likewise was barred. Testing a window, he found it both locked and nailed. In no mood to delay, Flash seized a plate from the sideboard and hurled it through the pane. Enlarging the hole, he climbed through, lowering himself to the ground. The sound of splintering glass had brought Fleur running from the dock. He swung his lantern so that the beam fell upon the cameraman. Hey, get back in that! get back or i'll fire flash did not believe that flora was armed to be on the safe side he dodged behind a tree hidden by the darkness he kept watch of the moving lantern and when he saw his chance ran for the road flora made no attempt to follow actually he was afraid for his own safety believing his employer's story that the young man had lost his mind flash ran until he was exhausted after that he walked at a fast pace the shoes he had borrowed from rascomb's wardrobe were too large for his feet and rubbed up and down at every step soon he was tormented by painful blisters on each heel driven by the knowledge that minutes were precious he kept steadily on the road was deserted of traffic cars neither approached nor passed him turning a bend he came within view of rascomb's private airfield a sudden fear assailed him. Already he might be too late. In all probability, the man had made a quick getaway by plane. Crawling under a fence, he hastened to the hangar. The huge doors were padlocked. Striking a match, he gazed through a window. 
to his great relief the monoplane was still there then rascomb must be at excelsior city or somewhere fairly close he reasoned that final deal he mentioned it is holding him here and may yet prove his undoing as far as flash was concerned rascomb's espionage work still was shrouded in deep mystery his knowledge of the man's past was merely vague rumor but there were certain definite points from which he might work he definitely knew that rascomb and albert povey were the same man from his own observation povey had displayed interest in bailey brooks new parachute which might or might not have significance and povey's interest in major hartgrove was a factor not to be ignored obviously he had boarded the streamliner with the intention of keeping the army man under observation the wreck itself might have been an accident but one which possibly had given povey the opportunity he sought he tried to steal something from the major and seemingly failed flash reasoned then knowing that his identity had been learned he deemed it wise to disappear but now he may make a final attempt to achieve his purpose the first thing i must do is get in touch with the major and warn him the road curved and a cluster of lights could be seen ahead flash quickened his step he was within view of clear lake at last a few minutes later he walked into the general store at the edge of the village the only occupant was a woman who stood behind the counter she stared as he moved toward her where can i hire a car to take me to excelsior city flash asked well now i don't know she answered with deliberate speech all the men folks is fightin the fire i'm lookin after the store for my husband isn't there someone here who has a car i could borrow or rent you look like you've been in the fire yourself mister i have flash replied briefly it's very important for me to get to town claude geyser might take you the woman interrupted he's too no account to do an honest lick of work or help the rangers but he has a car where will i find him second house past the post office he may not be at home the light shone in the dwelling and flash was relieved to find claude geyser there the young man displayed no interest in making the long trip to excelsior city but his attitude changed when a ten-dollar bill was waved before his eyes all right i'll take you he agreed reluctantly how soon you want to start now said flash and i'll do the driving the trip to excelsior city was made in fast time despite young geyser's frequent protests that his new car was being shaken to pieces at the hotel flash paid what he owed and they parted company left alone the cameraman hesitated after an instant of debate he decided to talk with major hartgrove by long-distance telephone before taking any action against rascomb accusing a man of being a spy even when i know it to be true is ticklish business he thought i'll need someone to back me up flash entered the hotel he crossed to the desk and asked for the key to his room mr evans exclaimed the clerk we understood that is your friend told us you were lost in the forest fire i'm very much alive flash snapped when did you last see doyle i haven't noticed him in the lobby since midnight midnight how late is it twenty after one sir flash nodded and walked to the elevator so intent was he upon his thoughts that he failed to see a familiar figure slip quietly from a telephone booth on the opposite side of the lobby the man was herbert rascomb End of chapter 18chapter nineteen of flash evans camera newshawk by frank bell this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by matt perard chapter nineteen a double resignation george doyle was in the bedroom sitting at the writing desk as flash pushed open the door he twisted in his chair to face him flash rather surprised to see me aren't you doyle surprised doyle arose unsteadily to his feet it's a miracle i-i gave you up for dead thought you had drowned so sorry to inconvenience you what are you looking at me like that for flash 
doyle asked in a shaky voice surely you don't think that i oh no flash broke in you wouldn't wish to harm me not you doyle listen the technician pleaded nervously i, I don't know what happened but I, I can see you have the wrong slant on things you think rascomb and i deserted you that's a mild way to put it we were sure you had drowned doyle repeated when the boat upset you must have gone down like a ton of bricks there was no sign of you anywhere i wanted to wait but rascomb was nasty about it he said if we didn't leave right away we never would get through the pass and you expect me to believe a tall story like that it's the truth you don't think i'd have gone if i had even a faint hope you were still alive doyle you're a very good actor but not quite good enough to convince me next you'll try to tell me you never saw a rascal strike me over the head what demanded the technician incredulously say that again you heard me rascomb stunned me with an oar after i accused him of being albert povey i fell into the water and was carried to the opposite shore that part you may not know flash you must be out of your mind doyle said anxiously rascomb wouldn't strike you as for his being albert povey that's ridiculous povey was killed in the train wreck oh no he wasn't flash denied he merely found it convenient to give out that impression povey and rascomb are the same person and you must have known it sit down and try to calm yourself doyle said solicitously you've gone through a terrible ordeal tonight you're pretty confused so that's your defense you accuse me of being out of my head don't you know what really happened doyle asked patiently suppose you tell me i'm sure you've thought of an interesting little fairy tale you and rascomb were in the boat when it suddenly upset rascomb was so busy trying to rescue the oars and the cans of film he didn't worry about you for a minute when he looked around you had disappeared beneath the surface then he yelled to me for help and you saw the boat upset well no i didn't doyle admitted i was taking pictures the truth is i had no idea anything was wrong until rascomb called to me then it was too late to do anything and what happened next flash demanded go on with the yarn i see you don't believe me but it's the truth rascomb and i righted the boat and shot through the pass we reached the lodge and started for here in the sound truck rascomb came with you we started together at clear lake he said he had forgotten an important matter and must return to the lodge since this part of doyle's story tallied with what fleur had reported about rascomb's actions flash was inclined to believe that the pair actually had started for excelsior city together and that later rascomb had turned back doyle spoke again in a strangely subdued voice flash we've never liked each other any too well that was my fault probably i haven't made things pleasant for you but i don't want you to think i'd be a party to any plot against you flash was impressed with doyle's apparent sincerity after all he thought there was at least a possibility that doyle had not seen rascomb's attack upon him the words had a genuine ring i don't know what to think he said slowly doyle made no further attempt to convince flash instead he reached for a sheet of paper on the desk and dropped it into the wastebasket i was sending a wire to the news view people he explained i'm glad it won't be necessary now flash's gaze wandered slowly about the room i came to rest upon doyle's suitcase neatly strapped standing by the door you're packed to leave doyle offered him a crumpled telegram this came while we were at brascombe's lodge from newsview doyle nodded gloomily we're ordered to cover a warehouse strike at clinton that's a hundred miles from here if it's afoot they're expecting fireworks tomorrow at seven o'clock when a crew of strike breakers comes on duty flash read the telegram which confirmed doyle's words this comes from not wiring clues when we were spending the weekend at rascomb's place he commented i made a mistake doyle admitted reluctantly 
and now well i'm in a jam you still can reach clinton by traveling tonight not with the sound wagon i burned out a bearing getting back from the lodge repairs won't be made before tomorrow afternoon you're getting one break at least said flash a new cameraman flash you can't run out on me on a time like this i don't like to quit because of joe but i have an account to square and some work to do that's the lowdown on why i'm staying if there was anything i could say to make you change your mind there isn't doyle hesitated then sat down at the desk and scribbled a message to be telegraphed to the newsview home office flash had picked up the telephone to call long distance send this when you're through will you doyle requested he tossed the message to flash entering the bathroom he started the shower running full blast flash looked at the telegram it read please accept resignation of jimmy evans and george doyle effective immediately flash reread the message then moving to the bathroom door he called to his roommate doyle could not hear because of the running water giving it up flash went back to the telephone he placed a call from major hartgrove at melfridge field and waited ten minutes elapsed the telephone bell jingled eagerly he took down the receiver the operator spoke it is impossible to contact your party she reported will you speak with any other person get me captain ernest johns again flash waited although a shorter time once more the operator had only failure to report captain johns and major hartgrove no longer are located at melveridge field she informed i am sorry flash hung up the receiver disappointed by his inability to contact either of the men a slight sound caused him to turn in his chair he stared the outside door stood slightly ajar he could not remember having left it that way as he watched fascinated it slowly was pulled shut someone in the hall had been listening to the telephone conversation End of chapter nineteen chapter twenty of flash evans camera news hawk by frank bell this LibriVox recording is in the public domain reading by matt Perard. chapter twenty accusations flash moved swiftly to the door and jerked it open the hall was deserted but as he listened he could hear the soft pad of footsteps fading away that door didn't open by itself he muttered someone was listening but whoever he was he's gone now flash re-entered the bedroom the shower was still running but in a few minutes doyle came out wrapped in his flannel robe did you send that telegram he asked no not yet doyle there's no reason for you to resign i'm fed up the technician responded shortly i've been thinking i may keep on for a while after all my plans aren't turning out the way i expected you mean you want to go on to clinton you believe my story then yes i don't honestly think you were a party to what happened today doyle drew a deep sigh i'm glad to hear you say that flash you've been pretty badly mixed up let's not argue that point flash interrupted my opinion about rascomb won't change i intend to report him to the police doyle frowned you're making a big mistake if you do that flash rascomb is an important man with connections around this city even if he had done what you think he did it would be hard to prove not if you'll testify with me doyle shifted his weight uncomfortably i couldn't be a party to railroading an innocent man innocent that bump on the head confused you flash doyle said anxiously maybe you ought to see a doctor you think i'm out of my head only on that one subject you've been suspicious of rascomb ever since you met him and for a mighty good reason i suppose you'll think i'm crazy if i tell you that rascomb and fleur locked me up in the lodge what doyle demanded incredulously after he left you rascomb came back he boasted that he intended to pull off a final deal and skip the country take a look at this 
flash drew the picture of albert povey from his pocket and slapped it on the table before doyle's startled eyes where did you get this flash in rascomb's desk it doesn't seem possible doyle muttered there is a marked resemblance i'll admit but rascomb has no scar you're mistaken there he's been using clever makeup to keep it covered now will you go with me to the police station i still think you're mixed up somehow doyle protested i hate to get involved in this mess rascomb isn't the man to take an accusation sitting down then i'll go to the police alone flash said shortly it won't take me long to make my report as soon as i'm through we'll start for clinton we can't get out of here until the truck is repaired why not hire a car we could take the hand camera get our strike pictures and come back here later for the truck we could do that doyle agreed do you feel equal to the trip flash shook his head impatiently no but i'll keep going somehow he changed his clothes and hastily packed his belongings in a suitcase doyle watched him with a troubled gaze flash you look bad he said after a moment let me call a doctor we haven't time i'm on my way to the police station now you might see if you can locate a car while i'm gone leaving doyle in the room flash went downstairs to the nearly deserted lobby as he reached the revolving door at the front entrance another man entered the hotel and they met face to face flash stopped short captain johns he exclaimed the army man peered at the young man an instant without recognition and then he remembered him evans isn't it yes i was trying to reach you by long-distance telephone only a few minutes ago flash began eagerly the captain cut him short major hartgrove and i arrived here early this morning glad to have met you again mr evans one minute flash protested as the man started to edge away i can't stop now captain johns apologized some other time i'll be glad to grant an interview i'm not after an interview or pictures i would like to give you some information about albert povey captain johns stopped short he gazed at flash intently albert povey no longer interests me he said the man is dead you are wrong sir povey never was killed in the train wreck i have proof of it impossible it happens that major hartgrove and i came here this morning to investigate that very thing povey is buried in a cemetery at clear lake i visited the grave myself it couldn't have been povey's grave the man still lives captain johns grasped flash by the arm come back into the lobby with me young man he urged if your information should be correct it will prove of vital importance to us flash sank into a chair beside the captain he offered the picture of povey and told where he had obtained it but do you realize what you are saying the captain demanded in amazement you are accusing herbert rascomb of living a dual life rascomb and povey are the same person flash insisted for years the man has been living a double existence as rascomb he's acted the part of a wealthy upstanding citizen as povey well i don't know much about his past albert povey was one of the most daring spies the government ever encountered explained captain johns he caused us great embarrassment recently evidence piled up against him had his death not occurred he would have been arrested within forty-eight hours i saw him on the train flash said at the time it appeared to me that he might have been shadowing major hartgrove your observation was correct povey knew that the government had taken an interest in a parachute which is being perfected by a man named bailey brooks he was under the impression that major hartgrove had possession of certain papers and specifications referring to it and when the train wrecked he tried to rob the major he made such an attempt and failed where is the major now flash asked i believe you said he was here at the hotel he is waiting for me upstairs and does he still have these specifications for brooks invention captain johns frowned in annoyance he felt that he had told the cameraman entirely too much the reason i ask is this flash said rascomb boasted while he held me prisoner that he intended to pull off one more deal 
before he disappeared he may have learned that major hartgrove is here major hartgrove is well able to look after himself the captain interposed dryly flash arose you don't believe my story he said i am convinced that you believe it returned captain johns your accusation against rascomb is amazing however i promise you a complete investigation will be made unless you work fast rascomb may disappear flash warned impatiently i was on my way to the police when i met you no you must not go there allow me to handle this yes sir a page boy crossed the lobby gazing questioningly toward the pair call for captain johns captain johns the army man signaled to the boy and upon learning that he was wanted on the telephone excused himself when he returned a few minutes later his face was sober i don't know what to think now he said that call was from charles w gordon gordon a prominent and respectable lawyer here in excelsior city he requested me to come without delay to room forty seven and to bring you with me why should gordon wish to see us he said he was representing herbert rascomb and had important information to offer it sounds like a trap exclaimed flash i hardly agree gordon is a reputable lawyer how did he know we were here in the hotel and together i was wondering about that mused captain johns we'll see him but if room forty seven is the spider's den let us keep an eye open for entanglements End of chapter twenty chapter twenty one of flash evans camera newshawk by frank bell this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by matt perard chapter twenty one rascomb's explanation motioning for flash to follow captain johns strode across the empty lobby to the desk curtly he questioned the sleepy-eyed clerk as to the occupant of room forty seven number forty seven it was assigned about a half hour to herbert rascomb i'm going up there to see a man informed the captain now get this straight if i fail to return to the lobby within twenty minutes notify major hartgrove in room two sixty seven tell him to join me is that clear yes sir twenty minutes flash and the captain walked up a flight of stairs to the first floor the room of room forty seven was opened by a dignified-looking man of forty-five who wore glasses and was slightly bald good evening gentlemen he said in a polished voice i should not have invited you here at such a late hour but certain misunderstandings must be cleared up before further harm is done mr gordon glanced significantly at flash as if to imply that he deliberately and needlessly had created trouble a man sat at the window his face swathed in bandages flash stopped short as he recognized him rascomb evans i can't tell you how glad i am to see you alive rascomb arose painfully and taking a step forward extended his hand i met doyle downstairs a few minutes ago he explained he told me of your miraculous escape from the fire i can't make you understand the feeling which went over me you are an excellent actor flash retorted ignoring the proffered hand but i don't doubt you are surprised to learn i was in excelsior city you thought you had taken care of me for several days at least my dear young man rascomb said soothingly you seem to be laboring under some delusion doyle warned me but i found it most difficult to believe let's sit down and talk this over in a sensible way interposed mr gordon through mr doyle we have learned that evans here has been making false and libelous accusations against mr rascomb false exclaimed flash angrily i can prove every statement i've made you most certainly will be given the opportunity the lawyer said possibly in court now i don't want to be too hard on you evans spoke rascomb quietly you have gone through an ordeal to-night enough to break an iron man slight wonder you became confused and thought your friends were enemies 
so i imagine that you struck me over the head with an oar and later that you locked me in the cabin rascomb gazed despairingly at captain johns turning to flash once more he said how can i convince you of the truth doyle will support my story you were thrown into the water when our boat accidentally upset you may have struck your head on a rock or a submerged log i know you failed to come to the surface doyle and i searched as long as we dared and did i lock myself in the lodge no admitted rascomb smiling faintly fleur shut you up there fleur questioned the captain my caretaker evans raved so much and told such an outlandish story that fleur considered him out of his head he locked him up and telephoned me i immediately ordered his release your story is very smooth said flash but there's one little detail you can't gloss over how about that scar on your cheek i have no scar prove it flash challenged take off those bandages mr gordon spoke with exasperation we are trying to be patient you make it most difficult in returning to excelsior city this evening from his hunting lodge mr rascomb was in a motor accident hence the bandages a very convenient accident i shall be glad to remove the bandages whenever my doctor grants permission said rascomb with dignity possibly by tomorrow however i assure you i have no scar unless i may bear some slight mark as a result of today's accident flash glanced toward captain johns who had listened attentively to the argument rascomb's story was so flimsy that he did not think the army man could place the slightest confidence in it to his amazement johns gave every indication of being impressed there was a moment of silence then rascomb inquired are there any other questions you wish to ask me i have nothing to hide one question said captain johns why did you have a picture of albert povey in your possession rascomb's eyes became wary but he did not lose poise i'm afraid i don't know what you mean captain this picture the army man displayed the photograph which flash had given him a few minutes before but did not place it in rascomb's outstretched hand oh that picture the sportsman said carelessly i found it among povey's personal effects his luggage was sent to me after i claimed the body and why were you so interested in povey pursued captain johns i must say that you bear a remarkable resemblance to him rascomb drew a deep sigh i had hoped to be spared this confession he said povey was distantly related to me a second cousin you may be sure i never was proud of the kinship i knew my cousin had an unsavory reputation and his activities never ceased to alarm and embarrass me heartless as it may seem his death came as a relief to me you changed your story observed flash yesterday povey was a stranger you befriended i told you that i admit however i considered your questions somewhat impertinent and i never have willingly admitted my relationship to albert povey he was the one black sheep in an otherwise honorable and distinguished family the telephone rang mr gordon arose to answer it for you captain he announced captain johns glanced at his watch and picked up the receiver what's that he demanded incredulously into the transmitter impossible hanging up the receiver he turned to face the surprise group not bad news i hope inquired rascomb captain johns did not answer his eyes roved about the room glinting with anger as they fastened upon flash evans he said sharply you have misled me we shall consider this investigation closed a triumphant smile crossed herbert rascomb's face he offered his hand to captain johns who shook it firmly you are a just and reasonable man captain i was certain i could convince you of the truth evans meant well but he allowed his imagination to run away with him he did that my apologies mr rascomb don't be too hard on evans rascomb replied with a show of solicitude a day in the hospital and he'll feel like himself again flash started to speak and changed his mind with the captain against him he had no chance angrily he started for the door wait commanded 
Captain Johns, I have a few words to say to you. Reluctantly, Flash paused. The captain politely bade Gordon and Rascomb good evening and departed. Once in the hallway, his manner immediately altered. Grasping Flash's arm, he guided him toward the elevator. Don't take what I said too seriously, Evans, he advised. There is something wrong here. While we were with Rascomb, an attack was made on the Major. End of chapter 21